Professor Hassan asked me a question. I tried to fathom what he wanted from this question. What is the importance of day six monitoring in your practice? And he clarified kindly the first visit after initiation of 5F stimulation, clinical, ultrasound, laboratory, and influencing decisions. You will be sick and tired of me reminding you of why or what we would like to achieve from ovarian stimulation. It's not just getting eggs at all costs. It has to be done safely. It has to be done successfully. And if we don't fulfill a particular potential, we, know we have not done it successfully. And I will come back to this potential business, okay? You are sick and tired of this slide. The more eggs we have, the better the chance of the patient leaving the clinic with a baby. And the explanation is more eggs, more fertilized eggs, more embryos in the freezer, and other chances from frozen embryo transfer. And it is established. More eggs or effective stimulation, you will increase the cumulative chance of having a baby Will be happy with a positive test and report the result as such or quote the implantation rates as a success but nowadays most people will be talking about cumulative live birth rate last tuesday i was running a clinic for about maybe 15 patients honestly eight of them were coming to have second baby from the same stimulation cycle from their frozen embryos so it is not something that is insignificant and it is worse trying for whenever it is possible and whenever it is safe. So what, is, what are the challenges that we face and we have to push, navigate through them in order to do our business effectively, safely, and cost effectively? When we do ovarian stimulation, our patient will come under one of three categories. One on the mainstream normal responder, one on the sad stream, that is the uh, poor responders, and one on the excessive response. With this one, there is high risk of cancellation because the response, with this one, there is risk of cancellation because of the risk of hyperstimulation, at least in the old days. And the risk of ovarian stimulation will increase exponentially with the number of eggs in the conventional way, as I will come back to this later. What established is what you have kindly and expertly both covered. We cannot get far with any IVF treatment without ovarian. May they differ ever so slightly with Professor Ahmad that we don't necessarily have to do every ovarian reserve test. When you have a patient with polycystic ovaries, she does not need AMH as far as I'm concerned. But I would agree totally with you. If you started with two to five with the aim of freeze all, you will cover all eventualities and there is little risk from these patients. So measuring AMH, when the ovary is jumping at you, telling you I have 30 antral follicles will add little value. Gonadotrophins are equally effective. We established that. Short antagonist protocol and long agonist are the main protocols that we use in our practice and increasingly the short agonist protocol for its safety consideration is the one that is preferred. Professor Ahmad very nicely and wisely suggested that you have not done everything possible for your patient with BCO or with high ovarian reserve if you didn't use a short antagonist protocol and consider agonist trigger and freeze all for appropriate patients. Very high doses of gonadotrophins, they only add to the burden of the cost. And it's expensive stuff and does not add much value. There must be a ceiling for how high we go. So the main challenges for ovarian stimulation is in the two categories. In the high ovarian reserve, the safety concern. If we are too safe, we could undermine the effectiveness because if you go with homeopathic doses of gonadotrophins, good proportion of these patients will end being cancelled 
for poor response because it will not touch them. Giving them 75 or sometimes 100, it may not be adequate. We also go for effectiveness because effectiveness, as I stated in the first slide, that a patient with BCO or high ovarian reserve, whatever it is, should produce good number of eggs and good number of embryos and have extra to freeze. If we fail to do that, we have failed this patient. The other end of the spectrum, poor ovarian reserve. And the challenge is how and what to do in order to improve effectiveness. And you'll have heard it from me several times and I will repeat it again. All what we please ourselves with interventions wise for a genuine poor responders will be as good as polo mint. You can give them distilled water. It is the same. We just please ourselves because we compare with some subjective comparison, but a genuine poor responder who have only three antral follicles or has AMH of two picomol per liter will not go anywhere, ne whatever you give her, it will produce or the patient will produce what her ovaries entitle her to do. In actual fact, calling, calling this group of patient poor responders is mistaken. They don't have much to respond. They have poor ovary reserve. They are giving the best they can have so calling them, uh, calling them poor response is a bit inadequate or inaccurate. Patient with poor ovarian reserve, like I said, the cost, because we tend to give them, some people give 600. That is really, I, I find nowhere to describe it as an ignorance of biology. If you give them two kilograms of gonadotrophins, it will not create more follicles. It only makes the patient bankrupt and lose the resilience to try again, because she spent all of her money on unnecessary gonadotrophin. If we start with the West group first, the poor ovarian reserve and the challenge of effectiveness and cause. So when we bring them early, like day five or day six, what do we want from this bringing early? And I can suggest that some people would say, oh, let's just see how the response is going because we can increase the dose further. Total and utter waste of time and money. Why are you bringing the patient on day six or day five? I would like to be challenged on that and corrected, and I'm open to change my mind and get educated. It is a long, long story. 1994, we're talking about 26 years. The value of increasing the dose of human menopausal gonadotrophin in women who initially demonstrated poor response. You guessed it. It is as good as useless. You might increase the level of estradiol, but we're not bringing the patient to increase her estradiol level. We are trying to make a difference. No significant increase in the cycle fecundity whatsoever. So why are we doing it? And that should, be, should have been well established 25 years ago. Professor Abulgar and the Egyptian IVF Center did a study increasing the dose of human monobasal gonadotrophin on day of GNRH antagonist administration, which is day five or day six. It absolutely of no value. Why? Are alter the outcome, urge people to reconsider that because if you spare the patient an extra visit with the traffic and with the cost and with the cost of estradiol, I am all for simplicity and I'm not inventing anything. Matt Wickland from Sweden back in 1992 published a paper showing that monitoring with estradiol in addition to Ultrasounds can add little value whatsoever. So many accomplished clinicians are running their center successfully only based on ultrasound monitoring. And you can see when you increase the dose for patients who show initial response, it makes no difference to the outcome. I, we published a paper in 2000 in fertility and sterility to the same effect. I choose not to cite it. What about the other challenge? The high ovarian reserve patients, like those with polycystic ovarian syndrome or polycystic ovaries, those who have previous history of ovarian hyperstimulation, and those who have ovarian reserve regardless of the underlying etiology. We have choices. And some of us have been brought up in a way, and they are loyal to the way that applied 10 years ago, and they practice it now. When there is an opportunity for us to look back and use the opportunities available to us. 
the choice of stimulation strategy for we would like to identify earlier before we start stimulation and then do the right stimulation strategy. The conventional approach, you know it better than me. You start with 1.25, 1, 1, um, 1.12.5, uh, or you start with 100, or you start with 75, or you bring the patient on day five and reduce the dose, or you see that the estradiol level is high and you start costing from early time, and we know that tinkering and that Mickey Mouse approach really gets the balance between safety and effectiveness. The patient will end up getting two or three eggs when she could have produced 25 eggs and nine or 10 embryos in the freezer and safely came back to have frozen embryo transfer time and time again later. So that is a conventional approach. The recommended approach is Patient with high ovarian reserve should be spared any risk of ovarian hyperstimulation, and they should be considered for the antagonist regime, agonist trigger, and freeze all. Now, I am aware of the practicality because different settings have different practicality. If you have difficulty accessing the antagonist, if you don't have good cryopreservation program, if you are not comfortable, fine, you can use those safe strategies, but at least you should aspire to have what it takes to fulfill the patient potential, which is the third finger or the third objective of um, ovarian stimulation. This concept, actually, I consider, I was speaking to one of my trainees the other day, and I say, I think it is really almost a failure to resort to ovarian hyper, to um, freeze all later in the cycle. Patient should be recognized in earnest. And sure enough, last week, I think, um, Raj Masur, who is known for his expertise with hyperstimulation, is now the president of the or the chair of the British Fertility Society, put his group in Manchester to look at about 1,500 cycles. What he could found that in that group of patients and in British practice, there was about 2% of moderate to severe ovarian hyperstimulation. This is totally unacceptable now because he looked retrospectively. And he could find that AMH of 35, which is equivalent to five nanogram uh, 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 units that are used in Egypt, and AFC of 20 or more identified 76% of the patients who developed ovarian hyperstimulation. He also found that when you use cutoff of 22.5 uh, picomol per liter for AMH, it has a sensitivity of including the patient who will develop a very simulation and specificity to exclude, to exclude those who want uh, of 60%. So they are of low exclusive uh, importance. 20 was the limit uh, of 83.5 and specificity of six, um, sorry, 70.8 and then 67. Egg number of 10 was not particularly, it, you could include a lot of patients falsely, but it's not specific. But he could find from the analysis that peak estradiol level had no predictive value. And we all almost, there is consensus that estradiol can be misleading. I may have mentioned previous um, uh, lectures that one of my colleagues in the same unit where I work had a patient who had polycystic appearing ovary, but she monitored her estradiol. During the monitoring of her estradiol after nine days of stimulation, not six days, she had estradiol of, I think on the day of trigger, she had an estradiol of 3,000 picomol per liter. Professor Ahmad Khalifa will tell you that in the United States, this 3,500 is less than 1,000 picomol per liter, per, uh, per mil, which means that it could be considered for cancellation for poor response. So that encouraged her to give her HCG trigger rather than give her an agonist trigger. This patient went into nearly intensive care, and this patient felt that her care was suboptimal, and this patient sued the hospital and she managed to get 40,000 pound in compensation to settle the case without going any further. So if you rely on estradiol, you are likely to be uh, taken by surprise in some cases because it's not accurate. The study also suggests that ovarian reserve parameters are far more
and you wait for ovarian response, you will do secondary prevention rather than doing primary prevention with that, from the outset. Patient with high ovarian reserve at, at risk of ovarian hyperstimulation, even if their ovarian response is not excessive, because if they don't do it early, they will have it late ovarian hyperstimulation if they get pregnant on that cycle. So what uh, Raj and his team suggested that decisions about preventive measures should be based on ovarian reserve rather than on ovarian response, which is the best way of prevention is primary. I am not suggesting that we all should adopt that tomorrow, but at least we should give, give it some fair consideration in order to improve safety and effectiveness. We are all aware of our anxieties about freeze all because it has been suggested that after freeze all cycles, there is high incidence of preeclampsia as one of the disadvantages. But recently, we became aware that this can be circumvented if we use natural cycle as best as possible or even um, ovulation induced than doing in the artificial cycle, as we discussed before. This advantage is the high incidence of large four-day babies, which you have debated and the whole world has debated, increase of 100 um, gram may not be the be all or end all, and still the, the, the scientific society is divided whether this is bad or good, considering that with IVF in general, there is increased low for gestational, age, low birth weight for gestational age baby. The advantages, however, of doing freeze all and segmenting the cycle, there will be lower incidence of preterm birth, which I think very suited to a sitting like ours in Egypt, lower incidence of small date for babies, and nearly you eliminate the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation and having a young patient being admitted to intensive care unit for no fault of her own, but just because we decided we don't like freeze all, or we like the long protocol better than the short protocol. This is unaccountable and, uh, and, and unfortunately, nobody will be able to defend that if accountability is something that we care for. We, the concern about development of children born from freeze only versus fresh transfer. This is a follow-up of randomized controlled studies that published about two weeks ago. And you can see the overall conclusion that there is potential for freeze all, um, uh, that there is potential for freeze all strategy to be used without any concern regarding infant child health and development in the first few years of life at least, because they did the follow-up study and it does not suggest that the environment any bad for children development. We are aware of where it is used, whether it is for hyper responders, the relative risk for pregnancy is, or for live birth is as good as, if not slightly better. When it is used for PGT, it is this talk and then one of my clinical fellow walked into the room uh, to ask me a question so I asked her show me what patient you are asking and she showed me this patient so this patient is 36 and she has been trying for 30 uh, for three years her cycles were regular she's having dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia and dyspareunia she has background um, endometriosis uh, or for what I can't, I can't remember the exact story, concentration of the sperm was absolutely fine on the face of it, so overall was judged normal. Tubes were patent, ovulatory cycle, uterus appeared normal, ovarian reserve. Look at AMH, is less than one nanomole, uh, nanogram, sorry. And uh, AFC appeared 12. So if I ask people, you know, you will tell me this patient probably she will need to maximize her chances. I will bring her for pre-treatment preparation uh, with due respect. All treatment preparation, whether it is using the pill or using estradiol, 
there is nothing to suggest that it improves live births and I stand corrected and we can have a discussion about that. So this patient, what happened is she, and, and starting short to long is a mute point because this patient can have short cycle in started on the sex edge and the first time we saw her was day nine. She had 11 follicles, the leading follicle were 14. So we gave her three more days, 11 follicles, the leading follicles were 17. And day 14 scan, she had a total of 15 follicles and some of them were 22. So she was triggered with HCG. And the, sam the semen sample on the day after preparation, it transpired that the post-preparation was not conducive to using conventional IVF, so we had to use ICSI. She had 17 eggs collected. She had 10 mature, which was disappointing, but when you know that her image is 6.2, still it has a bearing on the quality of the eggs, even though it, the emphasis is only on, on quantity. Out of the 10 mature eggs that were injected, nine fertilized normally and developed further. And you can see that embryo development, four of them or five made it to blastocysts of various degrees. And uh, uh, some did not or arrested after being compacted beyond day three or day four. Out of those who made blastocysts, one was judged to be the best one, which was BC2 at nine o'clock in the morning. But by the time she came for embryo transfer at midday, it was found to be three BB and good blastocyst and that what was put. And the rest unfortunately kept for one day to see what they will do and they are all degenerated. I'm not sure we would have altered this outcome in any way, shape or form because what mattered is that this patient, despite this a bit mixed profile in her first cycle, she had a positive pregnancy test from replacing one blastocyst and she had a baby and she was coming to try again for a second baby. So did we need to measure estradiol for this patient? Would the outcome would have been altered? I leave this to you. So, does estradiol measurement add value to monitoring ovarian stimuli do what we do? Because without this question, we'll do a lot of things because somebody else does them because we like doing them, because we have always done them, because we get a bit of information. Your information should not be at the expense of the patient. So it is all about the why. And that is my main take home message. Look at the Cochrane review that looked at summary of the main comparison, monitoring ovarian with TVS plus serum estradiol. I can tell you there are some of our colleagues in London will bring the patient twice for estradiol measurement. And every the morning and in the evening, the patient will have to part company with 90 pounds for that estradiol measurement. Does it have low quality evidence, but the overall outcome, it does not add any value to the overall chance of live births. So when is day six visit or estradiol monitoring is unnecessary? At least we can reach a consensus. If you have this, why are you bringing her early? Because you gave her two to five that Dr. Ahmed suggested and I, I agree with that. I may be a little bit conservative and usual and say, take the first four days of two to five and then we can revert to 200 or 150. Because once you get the recruitment going, those patients will be fine. And also you are intent on using uh, agonist trigger and ovarian hyperstimulation, uh, sorry, and um, freeze all. And those patients, no level of estradiol is uh, too risky for them. As long as you use the right measure, their ovarian, their ovarian hyperstimulation chance is almost zero. These patients with poor ovarian reserve, why should we bring earlier and why should we monitor with estradiol? In order to increase the dose, I demonstrated to you that it is useless. Those patients with normal ovarian reserve, they are not at risk of hyperstimulation and they will get their potential and they are not uh, uh, benefiting from increasing the dose throughout the course of ovarian hyperstimulation. So I would submit to you that probably you have to have a very good reason to bring the patient for repeated estradiol measurement. 
If you are still doing costing, I don't blame you because you may not have the right environment or you don't have the, agoni the antagonist or the agonist trigger, there is short supply. I don't go there. That is your prerogative and that is sitting uh, related. But if you have access to those, you better fulfill the patient potential and give her what she wants. Now, we all have learned the other way. I can, I know that, uh, uh, for example, Professor Imad Khalifa at the Jones Institute, every day they have a long meeting for the blood results. But that was in the 90s. Probably you'll find that the practice has changed in consideration of what I said in, in that eminent place, in other places where this has become unnecessary and unnecessary burden for the patient. And I think with this conclusion, I thank you and I will be happy to entertain any question. Thank you.